I don't know why it's taken me so many years to visit the crash site of Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, the big bopper J.P. Richardson, and pilot Roger Peterson. But at age 49 and being a lifelong fan of their music, I decided it was high time I did it. As you can see, I'm no spring chicken, just a middle-aged guy who loves rock and roll. One thing that keeps popping up in my mind is that for decades, I've lived just a few hours from the Iowa cornfield the plane went down in. I've often driven up and down Interstate 35 since I've had family in Des Moines. Every so often, I've entertained the notion of pulling off the road to visit the site. Just never did it. Till now. To say it was a moving experience would be an understatement. I picked a Monday smack dab in the middle of April 2013 to make my little pilgrimage. My wife Lisa tagged along to film and photograph the event. Clear Lake and Mason City, Iowa are just a couple of hours south of my home in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Interstate 35 takes you down there and cuts a swath between the two cities. Clear Lake on the west and Mason City a few miles to the east. The Surf Ballroom is located in Clear Lake, so we decided to start our adventure there. It's not hard to find. You just drive a bit and look for Buddy Holly Place. It takes you right there. It looks just like it did the night the Winter Dance Party rocked about 1,500 music fans, February 2nd, 1959. Excited teenagers, and some of their parents, witnessed legends perform their last show. Right outside the surf, a monument was placed to commemorate the event. It speaks for itself. Let me tell you how cool it is to visit this historic place. The whole time I was in there, I was giddy. I had goosebumps as I imagined the events that transpired that night. Here you're looking at the stage from the dance floor. A local catering company was preparing for an event. This view is from the stage looking out over the dance floor. This is what Buddy, Richie, the Big Bopper, Dion and the Belmonts, and Frankie Sardo saw as they performed that night. That's me, standing on the stage, soaking in the vibes. All right, we're on the stage that Buddy Holly played on, on his last night. Richie Valens, Richie Valens was actually playing drums for him on this, it's a sign. And uh, Big Bopper also played here too. Carl Bunch, their drummer, had frostbite, so he wasn't able to play, so that's why they took care of each other's drums. And uh, this actually is a built-on part of the stage, and look back here. That's more right where Buddy Holly stood. Right back in there. Can you follow me in there? I think I'll have This is where Buddy Holly stood. Ah, oh, the history. This is just so cool. Okay, and they would finish. They would head down, right back into here. 
Into the dressing room. The good folks who've kept the surf ballroom running and open to the public sure do deserve heartfelt thank yous from rock and roll fans. They let you just come on in and explore. I wanted to see a phone booth I'd read about for years, but it was locked shut. I went to the office and kindly asked if it could be opened. The nice lady there could not have been more accommodating. She grabbed her keys and let me write in. Okay, the night Buddy Holly played, he called his wife, Maria Elena. On that phone right there, the phone, the booth, nothing's changed. Richie Valens called his manager that same night too, with that phone. Legends held that thing. Winter Dance Party Tour. There sure wasn't much rhyme nor reason to it. If it had been set up better, the musicians could have had short several hour jaunts from show to show. But the way this thing was set up, well, it was just stupid. They were zigzagging all over the upper Midwest in sub-zero temperatures, fighting snow and ice. To make matters worse, the bus heaters often stopped working, and the bus would flat out break down in those dangerous temperatures. At one point, the musicians were lighting newspapers on fire in the aisles of the broken down bus in a last ditch effort to stay warm. No wonder Buddy, Richie, and the Big Bopper wanted to charter a plane, get off that bus, and get a warm bed in a hotel after all they'd been through. All right, this is the doorway where a coin toss happened between Richie Valens and Tommy Alsop. And uh, there's, it's under dispute now, but uh, I happen to go with Tommy Alsop's version because it correlates with Waylon Jennings' version. But uh, there was another seat on the plane and Tommy had the ticket and Richie really wanted to be on that plane, according to Tommy's version. And Richie begged him and begged him and begged him and says, hey man, let me, let me, have, that, let me, let me have that seat on the plane. And, Tommy stood right here at this doorway and said, well, we'll flip for it. And had a 50 cent coin. And they flipped and ended up heads. And 
uh, Richie won, so to speak. So, it was settled. Richie, Buddy, and the Big Bopper were the passengers. After the show, they piled into a station wagon around 12.30 a.m. February 3rd and headed east to the Mason City Municipal Airport. This is the runway the small airplane took off from. After takeoff, it headed northwest. Right into this very same sky. It flew over these cornfields. Here, we're heading north of Clear Lake, looking for the crash site. I've read that people in this area heard a plane flying close to the ground in the pitch black night. They flicked their house lights on in hopes of providing some kind of bearing for the struggling pilot. A different mood came over us as we drove closer to the crash site. Seeing those glasses at the edge of the field, well, it sure was a stark reminder of what happened. I've been to Graceland to pay tribute to the king, bought a ticket there, stood in line for a bus and filed through the place with hundreds of other tourists. This, as you can plainly see, is quite a different experience. Here, we're walking west from the road, looking for the crash site memorial. We stopped about a quarter mile from the road to look back southeast. We tried to imagine the plane as it headed toward the field from the airport. To the left, you can see the farmhouse where Albert and Elsie Jewell lived. The night of the crash, Elsie said she had heard a horrible motor noise. She knew it was a plane and she knew it was flying awfully low. She thought it was going to hit her house. It crashed a half mile west. this field sure is kind to allow strangers to walk on his land.
I was struck with how modest the memorial was. I left a guitar pick I'd used for years. It had been cloudy most of the day, but a ray of sunshine peeked through when we were there. I heard that happens often. Time I've been thinking 